just, they just said, whoa, what a miserable, rotten day. I said, do you think so? Well, how can a day be miserable and rotten when we're alive? And so is Jesus. Whatever the weather, it's always a good day. So let's thank God for the day that he's given to us. It's good to see you. And just one or two things. I, I first of all, just would thank Christian and Carla for their little gift yesterday. It was a really thoughtful thing with all the extra work that had gone in. So on behalf of everyone, thank you very, very much indeed. Much appreciated. I can't quite match that, but I always usually do give a little something. Um, and so I, I've got something here for everybody. Before you go out, it's not four sweets like they said, but I'm afraid it's one. <laughs> and please don't take the caramel because I like them. <laughs> and uh, just, you know, just be sensible. In fact, I think there may be enough for two of us each, two each. So just clear them out. It saves me putting weight on. So mm -hmm. there we go. Um, another thing just to mention, our uh, dear brother and friend Michael will be preaching next Sunday morning. So look forward to his ministry. And in the evening, uh, please try and get along to the evening service because we're uh, we're going to have a, a, an ordinary service, but in the service we want people just to share just some of the blessings that they've had or even challenges that they've had over the past year. We want to look back with thankfulness. We want to look forward with hope and anticipation. So if you can get next Sunday evening, as well as the morning, then please, please do so. So we're just going to bow together in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this very special time of the year. A time when we remember that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we pray, Lord, that despite all the festivities and the family gatherings and the presents, that we might have just seen a glimpse of your glory. We thank you that from heaven you came as a helpless babe, born in the darkness of a woman's womb, and yet emerged from that darkness and became the light of the world. We pray, Lord, that that light will shine in the darkness, that men and women may be able to behold the God who loved them, God who created them, a God who longs to save them. And we just pray, Heavenly Father, that this church may be a lamp on a hill that cannot be hidden. And we just pray that we might, as a fellowship, be able to shine not only in this village, but in the villages and the district around. So thank you for this time of the year. And yet we're very conscious that we cannot remain at the manger that would be wrong because as Jesus grew up and left Bethlehem so we need to grow up spiritually and that we might be able to leave the manger at Bethlehem and over the next few months make that journey with him to the cross so thank you father for all your goodness and your love to us for all the privileges that we've been able to enjoy just help us now in this time together, we pray, that your name may be honoured and glorified. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing, Joy to the world, the Lord has come. And let's be grateful and thankful that he has come.
Now, Christmas is a very special time for us all, but especially probably for the youngsters. And one of the things that youngsters look forward to is getting presents. Who's glad they've had a present? Thank you, Catherine. I'm glad you came. That's great. Yeah, we're all grateful to receive a present. And I have to be honest, I look forward to receiving presents too. I've had some good presents over the years, um, but probably one present that I probably treasure as much as anything is in my pocket. You see, a number of years ago, I was a bit, well, I'm still a bit old fashioned, but a number of years ago, I was even more old fashioned. <laughs> and um, I had a, a little phone, uh, uh, it was a Nokia phone, it was like a little brick. And that phone, I think, it was nearly antique. And I just kept the phone and it kept ticking over and ticking over. And it was either James or Jacob, I can't remember which, and said, Grandma, it's about time you got up into the 20th century. I said, but we're in the 21st, aren't we? No, you're in the 20th. I thought, oh boy, here we go. So why don't you get rid of that Nokia phone and buy something a little bit more up to date. Just think you can ring your daughter in South Africa free of charge. Cool, that made me listen. I thought, okay, okay. So they eventually bought me this. Wow, I love it. I absolutely love it. I use it every day. I wouldn't want to be without it. One of the things that it's got on, and I noticed one or two of you have got tablets for Christmas. Well, one of the things that's on here, it helps me with my maths, because it's got a calculator. Now, if I put it on and showed you the calculator, from where you are, you wouldn't quite see it. So, I've got a calculator. It's the first calculator that I ever had. And... It's here. This is the first calculator I ever had. And the thing is that it doesn't need batteries. That's a, that's a wonderful thing. So you save all the expense on batteries. But when I got this calculator, the thing that I looked at, I thought, hey, you know, the calculator tells us so much about the gospel, about the Christmas message, about the Lord Jesus Christ. And look, I just want to share some of these things with you. Just, if you've got a tablet and you've got a calculator, put your calculator on and just go along with me. You see, I look at this and I think to myself, that's a plus sign. And what's the plus sign in the shape of? It's in the shape of a cross. And when I look at the plus sign, it reminds me of the cross. You see, I, I wouldn't be here if there was no cross. You wouldn't be here if there was no cross. Christian wouldn't be a pastor if there was no cross. The cross is so vitally important. And why is it important? And who is it important to? Well then, I come down to this. Now, when I was at school, they called this the equal sign. You still do, thankfully. The equal sign. So that's kind of telling me that in God's sight, all people are equal. It doesn't matter of your color of skin. It doesn't matter whether you're wealthy or whether you're poor. It doesn't matter whether you're brainy or a little bit like me. It doesn't matter at all. The gospel is for all people. And that was the angel's message right at the beginning in Luke 2. For all people, all people are equal in God's sight. And you've got to remember that. Then I come to this sign. Now, some people call it the minus sign. That, that's ridiculous. It's not a minus sign. That's a takeaway sign. <laughs> that's how we used to talk. It's a takeaway sign. So what does the gospel do? Well, why did Jesus die? He died, all people, black, white, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, 
all people, he died to take away our sin. You know, the most wonderful thing for me in life is to know that I'm forgiven. All my past has been forgiven. It's remarkable you know that. You can live in the sight of forgiveness. So there we have the takeaway. But we've got MC now. I don't know whether you've got MC on yours, but on my first calculator, MC stood for, not the literary cross, the master of ceremonies, it stood for memory cancelled. Wow, this even gets better. He died on the cross to take away my sin and to cancel the memory of it. I love the verse, I will remember your sin no more. I don't care what you've done in life, I don't care what your past is. You know, I, I always get a little bit worried when some people give a testimony and they spend 20 minutes giving a testimony and about 15, 17 minutes is all about their past and just about one or two minutes on what happened to them. Look, I don't care what a person's past is. That's something that God and the person has to deal with. But what I do know is that when our sins are taken away, the memory is cancelled. He remembers our sins no more. And then I come to this one, and this is probably for some a glorious fact. For some, it should be a terrifying fact. That's a division sign. On one day there will be a division. We're told in the Bible that the sheep will be separated from the goats. What it's saying is that those who love Jesus, one day will be totally separated from those who have rejected Jesus. There's no question that one day a division will come. Just one thing that I want to say before we move on from this. Do you, do you believe that these things are true? How do I know that he died for my sin? How do I know that all people are equal in God's sight? How do I know that he takes away our sin? How do I know that he cancels the memory of it? How do I know of the great division that we will be separated one day, those who love Jesus, those who reject Jesus? How do I know that this is true? Well, just let me ask you, do you believe that this calculator works? Okay, put your hand up if you think this calculator works, thank you, Christian. I'm glad you came to me. Put your hand up if you don't think it works. Okay, the vast majority. Well, let me tell you it does work. Now, I'm going to do a mathematical equation. And someone like Michael will know the answer straight away. No problem whatsoever. So, Michael, if you could just give me the answer, I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to multiply, there we go, the multiplication's in, 1, 9, 1, multiply by 1, 9, 8, the answer please. <laughs> Anybody got the answer? No. Oh, well, there you are. You've got it now. 37818. So it just proves that my calculator does work. But how do I know that all that I've told you is true? Well, if I turn this upside down, 
Does anybody tell me what it says? Yeah. What? Yeah. Is somebody going to tell me what it says? Shout it out. Shout it out as though you're shouting to your dad. <laughs> you're nearly right, love. You're nearly right. It says the Bible. So, how do I know all these things are true? Because the Bible tells me so. One of the very earliest songs I used to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. So if you've got a calculator, whether you're a child or an adult, just from time to time, think your calculator up. And just look at these symbols around and many others. They tell you a remarkable story. A story about God's love, about Jesus, about the cross, and about forgiveness. And the Bible tells us so. And try and remember that on your calculator. I'm going to read now from Luke's Gospel and chapter 2 and from verse 20. Luke chapter 2, verse 20. It's on page 857 in the Church Bible. And the shepherds return. Glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb, first opens the womb, shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you are prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, a sword will pierce through your soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phineo of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshipping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. 
And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favour of God was upon him. May God bless to us that portion from his precious word. I wanted to try and find a hymn that would fit in with Christian subject or part of Christian subject. And I came across a hymn that is not published in any hymn book that I can find, but it just brings the story of Simeon to our thoughts. And for Mark's benefit, I've chosen a tune that he probably will know quite well. We'll stand and sing our next hymn. Oh, 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 oh,
morning. Good morning. Merry Christmas to you as well. For those who are not here and able to make it yesterday, good to see you. Hope you had a good day. Um, we certainly did here yesterday morning. It was a lively occasion. It's a, a blessed one to see. So let's, let's pray again before we look at this section of scripture. Father, thank you for all of the blessings that we've received so far this Christmas period. Lord, thank you for yesterday, for all that you gave to us, and for all that we were able to give because of what you've given to us. Lord Jesus, we praise you this day as we look back and are reminded again of that glorious time when you visited this earth, when you came as one of us, and the reaction of the world when you did so. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would warm our hearts now, that you would speak to us, that you would guide us, that your word would come alive to us, not just today, but for the remainder of this year and into 2022. Lord, we pray this all for your glory's sake. Amen. Three things we're going to look at from this little section of scripture. Uh, firstly, the dedication of Jesus. Uh, secondly, the departure of Simeon. And finally, the dedication of Anna. So firstly, let's look at Jesus. Jesus fulfilled the law in every way. And that's really, really important. If he hadn't done that, then when he grew up to be a man, there's no way they would have uh, kind of welcomed him or even allowed him to, to say a word in the synagogue. They knew that he kept to everything, but not just him, because dedications are not really so much about the child. They're about the parents. That's why we do dedications here at Wellington Chapel. We don't do infant baptisms because we, we believe that a dedication is the parent's responsibility, saying, this, this child that God has given to me, this child that God has blessed me with, this gift, I want to dedicate this child to God's service. I want to kind of give him back, in a way, give her back. And that's what's going on here. <coughs> the law in the Old Testament certainly was our, our guardian, but everybody was held captive under the law, imprisoned, until he who was above the law, Jesus, came under the law to free us from the law. That's what he did. And Mary and Joseph, they're showing their obedience and their godliness here in Luke 2, because they're obeying the local law, if you like, of the Roman government, that was in power at that time, that has called them to go back to their, their hometown. So we just have a look back in verse 4 of Luke 2. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. He was obedient. Sorry, Mark. They've been obedient to local law, so that's what brought them back to Bethlehem. But they're also being obedient to God's law. They're bringing themselves to the temple for purification as well. Mary's just giving birth to a child. And maybe Joseph was involved, I'm pretty sure he was, in delivering Jesus. They're at the temple. They're in Bethlehem. They're dedicating Jesus. They're honouring God. They're acknowledging that this child wasn't really produced by them. Yes, humanly speaking, all the, the, the things that happen when, when the lady is pregnant, they all happened between Mary and Jesus in terms of the food that she was consuming and there was that connection in the womb and all the rest of it. That all happened. But they did not produce that child. God produced And this child, who belongs to God, in verse 21 we get this revelation of his name, 
At the end of the eight days, when he was circumcised, okay, keeping to the law, he was called Jesus. The name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. The name Jesus literally means the Lord saves or savior. The Lord saves. He came from heaven to earth, yes, to be son of God, king of kings, to be lawgiver, to be lord of lords. Yes, he's a prophet, he's a priest, he's judge, but the name that's given to him that will stand out, that will be above all other names, is the name Jesus. That's his most common name. That's the name that people will speak for hundreds or thousands of years. The standout truth about this little baby is that he will deliver, he will redeem, he will save. Yes, he does all that other stuff too. And those are really important things. He's a teacher, he's a prophet, he's a priest, he's a king. He will judge you one day. Is he your saviour? Has he saved you? He will judge you, but has he saved you? Because when it comes to that day that John was talking about, where there's that separation, those who he has saved, those who have not been saved, the unsaved, the lost, the separated, not just separated from the saved, but separated from the divine covenant love of God for all eternity. This is huge. And the most dangerous place to be when, when you're thinking about all this, you're either in two camps. You either think, I don't need to be saved, or you think, I'm beyond saved. I'm too much bad, or I'm good, I don't need to be saved. It's one of those two things. If you think, if you don't need to be saved, then you're so full of pride, you overestimate yourself. But if you, you think you're beyond saving, then you're so full of doubts, you underestimate Jesus and the power of his grace and forgiveness. He has the power, he has the the willingness to deliver you from spiritual blindness, from guilt, from the, the bondage of sin. I love the words that we sing, how sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. What a beautiful name, the name of Jesus. Jesus, my shepherd, my brother, my friend, my prophet, priest, and king, my Lord my life, my way, my end, except the praise I bring. His name is Jesus. He's come to save. And I know here at Wellington Chapel, we don't just talk about that at Christmas time or Easter time. We talk about it every week because it's the gospel, isn't it? While we're here, it's important that we keep talking about these truths. It's central to everything that goes on in the Bible. And I know it's been unusual for some of you this year since you've joined the church here to, to hear me go on about things that maybe have been quite insignificant to you in reading Scripture before, especially in the Old Testament. And I, and I keep going on about, oh, look, the third day, the third day. It's here all the way through the Bible. And you think, so what? It could be the fourth day. Yeah, but it's not, is it? Third day. Why does he keep talking about death all the time and then he rose or she rose up or she got up after she was laying down? Why is he talking about all that stuff? Why is he talking about death and then life? This is the gospel. Everything in the Old Testament was pointing towards the coming of Jesus. His life, his death, his resurrection. Everything afterwards in the Bible and the New Testament is looking back to that moment and preparing us and guiding us on how to live until he returns again. That's the Bible. And that's why we make such a, a big deal of all of this. It's his name, Jesus, is a strong tower for us to run to. It's anointment, a soother. When Jesus is here, presented 
at the temple. He's being dedicated, presented to the world, essentially, the Savior. I am here to save you. I'm here to save the world. So that's Jesus, the dedication of him. Secondly, the departure of Simeon. So Simeon is a really cool and godly guy. And his name means the one who hears. Verse 25 tells us that he's righteous and devout. Words that I'm sure each and every one of us would like to be described of us, of our life, by the Holy Spirit. How good would it be to have those words on our tombstone? Here lies righteous and devout. Stunning words. But his name means the one who hears. Simeon is a man who has his ears open to what God is saying. He's listening for the gentle guidance of the Holy Spirit. His eyes are open to what's going on all around him. He's very aware of the spiritual things, not just the physical things. A lot of people on this day just saw a couple of Jewish parents bring in a little Jewish boy to be dedicated. It happened all the time. Because that's what Jewish parents did. Just normal. Simeon saw beyond the physical, beyond the, the normal stuff. Because he was listening. He was watching, he was looking, he was aware. He had his, his eyes open, but more so than that, he had his heart, his soul was open to heaven. How easy is it this time of year for our, our ears and our eyes and our hearts to be closed to heaven and just be so obsessed with the physical world and the physical stuff? I'm guilty, of that. I get wrapped up in it all. We see family, and a lot of them are not. Christians, and we get kind of just swallowed up in the norm of what goes on all around us. We get obsessed with, with all the worldly things, and sometimes we just have to take a step back and, and just open our ears again. Be like sitting and just say, Whoa, let me just take a step back and, and be open to heaven. What's going on in this situation? It's more than just these physical words that I'm hearing, more than just these physical things going on. Every day, angels are bombing back and forth between heaven and earth. You don't see them. All this stuff is going on all around us. Are we, are we open to that? Are we listening? Yesterday, we were speaking about God visiting and giving. And Simeon tells us why. Verse 29, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Look at those words that are being used here peace, salvation, light, revelation, glory. It's as if Simeon has, excuse me, found his, his fulfillment. The moment that he's been living for his whole life. He's like, I'm done. This is it. This is the moment I've been waiting for. That's enough for me. My, my, my work on earth is done. I'm ready. I'm ready to go up. He strikes me as a man who is definitely ready to go home. Longing to go home. He has no fear of death. He has hope in death. The number one thing that is feared all around the world, this man Simeon's looking forward to. He can't wait. I'm sure, like Paul, he had moments where he was pleading. Come on, I'm ready. Just get on with it. Take me home. Why doesn't God take people home even when they want to go home? Why didn't we do that? I remember chatting to a, a very godly older lady some years ago. And she said to me several times, Christian, I'm, I'm ready to go home. I ask him to take me home every day. But every day that he says no, 
It's a reminder to me that I still have work to do on this earth. There's still stuff for me to do. And I haven't done it yet. And when I'm finished, then he will send his angels and he will take me away. But his time, I have to be patient, I have to trust in his timing. That's what's going on here with Simeon. And it's not just older people who, who maybe feel that they're near to the end of their life. The Apostle Paul was quite a young man when he talked about that. Well, what's better for you, Paul says to the church, is that I stay. Because you could do with my leadership and my guidance, but actually, if it was just down to me, I'd be gone. But like now, I'm ready. I want to go and be with him because it's better by far. Much, much better than I go and be with Jesus. But the Holy Spirit said to Simeon, No. Wait, and you will have the privilege of seeing Messiah face to face before you go. Now, how, how can we hear the voice of God like Simeon hears the voice of God? Now, we can say, well, read the Bible. That's the most obvious answer, isn't it? Read the Bible, and you get to, to hear God speak. The problem is, a lot of these people at the temple, they would read their Bibles. But is anyone else making a fuss of little baby Jesus? Oh, oh all the rabbis and the religious leaders and everyone else. Whoa, oh, everybody, stop. Stop the service. The Messiah's here. Let's cancel the service. Let's gather around Jesus. Praise God. We don't read about any of that. There's nobody else, it seems had their ears open to God and their eyes open to these spiritual things. But they never read the Bible. They knew it. They memorized it. They know that. Or were they open to heaven? Or were they just reading it in a, in a worldly sense? Because we can do that. We can read this and it can be like any other book. But for it to truly become the inspired word of God, which it is, but for it to become that in our hearts and affect us, so that we dedicate our lives to God, we need the Holy Spirit. We need to be that, we need that connection between heaven and earth. Simeon clearly has that, that connection. Now, God doesn't speak to everybody who reads the Bible. But the important thing is, if he does speak, are we listening? Are we open to what he's saying? This is one of the reasons why I said earlier this year that I'd like us to sometimes slow down in our reading of scripture and not just kind of tick it off the list and oh, I read the Bible <laughs> twice this year, but rather slow down sometimes and just dwell and pray about what we've read and just really let it sink in deep to the core of our soul. And ask God and speak to God. Pray and read in the Bible. They have to go together. They have to. Reading the Bible without praying. I won't say it's a waste of time, not a waste of time. Never reading the Bible, never a waste of time. But it's important that we pray over what we read. Let it digest, let it percolate in our hearts and our minds. Just slow down a little bit. And sometimes people will say, well, God, God spoke to me very clearly. I was reading the Bible one day or through another believer and he guided me on what to do, whether it was a calling to move or, or do something in particular for God or to wait upon him. But then he never really spoke to me again. I was expecting him to speak that clearly and guide me that clearly and prompt me that clearly every day. And I kept on reading the Bible, and I kept on praying, but he never spoke to me in the same way. And maybe it's just, that's what he had to say to you, so just carry on with that. Now we get the impression with Simeon that his whole life was, was heading for this, this beautiful moment. And I'm sure he had loads of great moments in his life. But when God lays something this big on your heart, Everything else is just a little bit like, meh, why? When God lays something heavy on you, 
when he guides you to do something, when he prompts you, and it could be for a person, not just a, a calling or something like this, it could be anything. Everything else then is kind of like a bit blurry, but that thing is HD, forgotten all the technical stuff here, or what the top tellies do, megahertz this, and whatever else, ratios, it's clear. It's clear and it's in focus. But all the other stuff is just a bit, I mean, that's all right. It's okay. It's like your favourite present at Christmas time. You kind of zoom in on that one and it's like, oh, that's so good. But everything else is like, that's all right. It's quite nice. All right. But that, that's my focus. That's the impression we get from Simeon. I've just met him. Glory. This, this is the moment. If he kind of had a, an overview of his life, if he, he gave, I don't know, if he was writing his own obituary and he, he was like, this is my life, this is what happened, he might just literally write, I met him. Then I could go on. That's it. That's all I want to tell you. But there's more, because it's not just peace and salvation and light and revelation and glory, all that, that amazing stuff. And just as Mary and Joseph are marvelling over these words of praise for the little newborn child, Simeon hits them with, with some more sobering words, really. So we'll just have a look at verse 34 again. Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts will be revealed. We get some imagery here from Isaiah, several sections of Isaiah, mainly I think chapter 8, uh, verse 14, and there's lots and lots of references to Isaiah in Luke 2. But this is the, the standout word I'm going to read to you now. Isaiah 8, verse 14 says, He will be a holy place. For both Israel and Judah, he will be a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble, they will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. Bind up this testimony of warning and seal <coughs> God's instruction among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord. And this is what Simeon is doing. He's waiting for the Lord. He's waiting upon God. And he's given an honest description about how the world will react to this little baby boy. And it's a description as I have provided a thousand years before Jesus turned up. So this shouldn't be surprising news. Certainly not to the people of God. This boy's ministry will expose people's hearts. It will make people feel angry. Some will love him. Some will get on their knees and worship him. Some will dedicate their lives to him. Others will want to kill him. They will hate him that much. And he will be an expression, the exact expression of God's will. And the reaction to him will reveal people's reaction to God and to heaven. It's a warning. Simeon's given a warning. It's not going to be a bed of roses. And not for you, Mary. People are not going to be indifferent to this boy. They're either going to love him or hate him. They're either going to follow him or ignore him. Or him. When we think about Mary, I just think like, Oh, how hard for a parent to witness this happening to your child. Mocked, questioned, rejected, beaten, crucified. Everything that Simeon prophesied came true. Obviously, because he was listening to the Holy Spirit. He was listening to God who sees the beginning from the end. Jesus was a light to the Gentiles. He was glory to Israel. He did divide opinion. And do you know what? He still does. You go out in 2022 and you start talking and using the name of Jesus and you will divide. 
you may as well be carrying around a sword because you will split. Some will say, yes, he is Lord, he is light, he is Savior. Many will say, I don't want to hear that name. I want to kill that name. I want to remove it from the dictionary, from everybody's lips. That name is dead to me. Okay, finally, let's consider the dedication of Anna, not in the same way as Jesus, but the dedication of her life. She was a prophetess, and these are the words that describe her. Worship, prayer, <coughs> fasting. I wouldn't mind them words on my tombstone either. What incredible words to describe this godly woman. She's a woman of worship, a woman of prayer, a woman of that fasting. Now prayer, as we know, is speaking to God, sometimes for yourself, often for others, where we, we intercede on behalf of, of other people. And in 2022, we have some exciting plans for prayer. And something I think we, we want to fan into flame, because lots of people have noticed when they've been visiting or, or recently joined the church, that this is a very prayerful church. But we don't want to just say, oh, that's, that's a good, strong point of the church. We want to keep going with that. We want to strengthen that and really push forward. This, this is what is the engine room of the church. We've got to keep oiling it. We've got to keep looking after it. Keep pushing. So people watch out for that in the year ahead. Fasting. Now, we have spoken about fasting in the last 12 months a little bit. But essentially, it demonstrates a spiritual hunger for heavenly things, for God. It's a way of saying, I know that my body will be shouting to me, feed me food. But I realize in my soul that I need spiritual feeding far more. More than food. Your kingdom come, your will be done. It's a hunger for God, it's a hunger for his kingdom. Remember when, I mentioned this at uh, James and Beth's wedding the other day, um, when Jesus came to earth and his disciples were there and the religious leader said, why are they not fasting? And Jesus said, well, because the bridegroom's here. In other words, he's saying, you fast for a longing for God, for the presence of God. And he's like, I'm here. So why would they fast? They're, they're having food, they're eating with God, with the king. Well, why are we going to go without food and say, oh, I long for the presence of God? That's what they were doing. Well, they got me. When I go, then they'll fast until I return. That's what fasting is all about. So this, this godly woman, Anna, she fasts regularly. She prays regularly. And those two things go together like peas and carrots. They, they definitely go together, like reading your Bible and prayer, reading your Bible, fasting and prayer. It's big. Important. Asking God to fill us up. Empty us of all the worldly stuff, fill us up with the heavenly stuff. The good stuff. And then finally, worship. Worship is not just sin. And I know I keep boring you by saying that from the pulpit, but we all need to be reminded because we all make the same mistake. When we talk about worship as if it's just a music and singing and that's an important part of worship but that is not what worship is we worship god with our every breath our every thought everything that we do is it's what we're about it's why we do what we do that's what worship is it's not just words and if you don't believe me read amos we looked at that a couple of years ago on sunday evenings and essentially one of the strong messages of amos is you lot, worship me with your mouths, but your hearts are far away from me. You can't trick God. You can't be an amazing singer or really get quite lively in, in, in the singing time when your heart is far away from me. That's not worship. Worship is everything. It's our words. It's our, our hearts. It's our thoughts. It's our life. The dedication of what we do day in, day out. It's not a Sunday thing. It's a Monday thing. It's a Saturday as well thing. It's a life. Somebody wrote this. 
Sometimes our most productive years in spiritual service for God come after our most productive years of earthly toil. Anna has given herself full time to a ministry of intercession. Like Simeon, she hopes for the redemption of Jerusalem and tells others that the baby Jesus is a reason for praising and thanking God. Those things are massive in desire <laughs> as well. So here are two people, Simeon and Anna, and they're, they're coming to the end of their life. But they're still serving God full steam ahead. They haven't slowed down, have they? If anything, they're like a train that's accelerating in faster and faster. And they're like, come on, we don't know. Let's have it. I came there, 85 years old. Like, Bring it, I'm ready. I'm as strong now as I was before, and I'm wiser too. And they reveal the life of a committed follower of Jesus in a hostile world. They're not sugarcoating. They're saying it's tough. This life is tough. But it's full of promise and it's full of praise. It's a, a triumphant life. It's a victorious life. There's so much victory in how they speak, in how they live. And as we look back on 2021, I would think it's fair to say that it's been difficult year, challenging year. How does our service compare with and with Simeon? I wonder what service God will be calling you to in 2022. Will you have your ears, your spiritual ears, open to what God is directing you to? How will you dedicate your life to him? I don't know. I'll be listening to God for you, I hope. He's prayed that John and I will do that. You need to be listening too. You need to be ready. But one of the other things I just want to finish with is how content Simeon and Anna seem to be. Chasing the right things. The most discontent people I have ever met in my life are those that spend far too much time chasing the wrong thing. And some of those things on paper seem good, but they're not the right things for them. They're the right things they think for themselves, but they're not open to God. They're not the right, specifically the right things for them. And Simeon and Anna are essentially, they're witnesses, they, they link the law, prophecy, and the gospel, and they tell us that Jesus ties all of this together. But actually, let's, let's finish by just turning your Bibles to Leviticus for a moment. Just look at Leviticus 12, and I'll read from, from verse 5. If you think about Mary and Joseph now, just cash your mind back to the beginning. You think about this dedication, Mary and Joseph bringing Jesus to the temple. Verse 5 of Leviticus 12 says, But if she bears a female child, and she be only for two weeks, uh, sorry, verse 6, and when the days of her purifying are completed, whether for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting a lamb, a year old for a burnt offering and a pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. And he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her. Then she shall be clean from the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who bears a child, either male or female. And if she cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her, and she shall be clean. Mary and Joseph were a godly couple, but they didn't have much money. They were poor. They couldn't afford a lamb, and that's why they didn't bring one. Or did they? Because they brought the Lamb of God to that temple that day. They brought the one who would save the world from their sin. The Lamb who would be sacrificed, who would die on a cross, 
and be punished by God for everything that we've done wrong. The one who Mary would have to watch beaten and crucified. But then the one that she would see rise from the grave on the third day, reappear to hundreds of people and then ascend back to the Father and remain alive, interceding for God's people until Jesus returns to this earth again and collects us and takes us home. That's what will happen to you if you're a follower of Jesus. You're waiting upon the Lord. Dedicate your life to him. Follow him. Listen to him. And then when, when it's ready for you to go home, you'll know because Jesus will come again. And you will see him face to face. Father, we ask as we come to an end of 2021 many different challenges and temptations and fears maybe even the fear of death Lord, we would ask that we would be more like Simeon and Anna, <coughs> that we wouldn't fear death but find hope in it Lord, that we would wait upon you that we would trust you that we would listen to you. And Lord, we pray that you would guide us very clearly in 2022. Help us to slow down when we're rushing. Help us to speed up when we're being lazy. But Lord, please guide us, we pray. And thank you for who you are and all that you've done for us and trust that you will do much, much more in the year ahead. Lord, we praise you and pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand together and sing our closing carol. And um, also, if you haven't had one of the little houses that I can't take any credit for, um, it was Carla and the girls that have made those. Uh, please help yourself to those on your way out. The verse inside will be our verse here at Wellington Chapel for 2022. So uh, no spoiler alerts on it, you're open to read it yourselves. Let's stand. <laughs>
Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who's a bit flat, a bit down, a bit dead, I pray, Lord, that you would raise them up, that your spirit would come and speak and empower and guide and, and just uplift, Lord. And I pray that in the days ahead we will all be excited to see the resurrection life visible to each and every one of us. Lord, please help us to live this way, the way that you've create, created us to live. I pray these things all for your glory's sake. Amen. Amen.